The full economic impact of COVID-19 has yet to be known, of course, but for some people, the hit was almost immediate. Performers who need audiences in their seats each and every night were just some of those who lost their livelihoods as soon as the province began shutting things down. What is it like when the show just can't go on? Let's find out. In Niagara-on-the-Lake, via FaceTime, we welcome Torkel Campbell, singer-songwriter with the band Stars. And in Toronto, via Skype, from their respective locations, Quinn C. Martins, a stand-up comedian, and actress Samora Smallwood, who is also co-chair of Actors Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And we're delighted to welcome you all to our little makeshift situation here on TVO tonight to talk about trouble for the nighttime economy. Uh, Torka, let me start with you. When did you realize <clears throat> that this pandemic was going to be essentially a catastrophe for your musical career? Um, I had a sense pretty early on, uh, about March 7th or 8th, I started, I was reading the news a lot and I started to think about what was about to happen. And then Coachella got canceled and South by Southwest got canceled. And it became clear that, uh, if those things were going to get canceled, everything was going to get canceled. Um, and then I flew to Niagara on the Lake with my daughter cause my wife works at the Shaw festival or worked at the Shaw festival. Um, and I got here on the 11th and by the evening of the 12th, my sister, who is a stage manager, had lost her job. My brother, who's an actor, had lost his job. My wife had been told that by April 6th, she would probably lose her job. Um, and then after the, the next 48 hours, literally everybody I know, every single person I know lost their job. Um, there's not a single performing artist working in this country right now. My goodness. Quinn, as a stand-up comedian, how much of your livelihood depends on performing in front of live audiences? Um, I'd say a good 50%. Um, uh, I do own uh, some small businesses, but uh, outside of that, the bread and butter is stand-up comedy. And uh, uh, much like Torkel, it was the same thing. Uh, I was supposed to do a comedy festival in Washington, D.C., and they canceled that. And uh, it was a trickle effect that started canceling and more and more shows got canceled as well as venues closing up. So yeah, it's uh, it's impacted the wallet a little bit, but uh, uh, there are other comedians that are struggling far worse than I am, yeah. Sounds like it's impacted more than just a little bit. Sounds like you've lost ha at least half your income right now, fair to say? <laughs> uh, yeah, a fair amount of my income, yeah. I'm not really worried about it, but yeah, yeah definitely a fair amount of my income is, uh, has been cut off. Mm. Mm. So Moro, what production were you working on before COVID-19 hit? First, I want to say thank you so much for hosting the show and for having me. Um, right before we did COVID, I was lucky. I've been working a lot back to back. I did uh, a couple of movies uh, in November and one in February. So uh, that was nice. But a production that we were, I would be working this week on another <clears throat> film, but it has been postponed. So the TV shows are all on hiatus and the films have been postponed. So for me, uh, as an actor, a member and an actor, the performance, like our industry is resilient and it's grown a lot here in Toronto and there's been so much work on everyone involved in the industry to grow it. So nothing has been canceled. We aren't hearing that word. It's been postponed or on hiatus, but it certainly is um, really crappy because everyone that you know who was supposed to work on a show is working on a show, supposed to go to set no one's working. And when you're not working, you're not making money. And that's not just the actors, but that's also the crew who rely on those gigs back to back to be able to sustain their life. So it's tough. But your mm -hmm. hope and expectation is that as soon as all of this ends, you guys will pick up some more right from where you left off and start shooting again? Yes. So when the news had started to trickle out, we were already doing our hair and makeup and costume tests. So we're in the thick of things. And again, we just celebrated the biggest year we've ever had for film and TV in Toronto. $2.16 billion of production was here last year. So it's impossible to destroy that industry. I can't say that without telling you how concerned I am about how people will survive in the interim and the loss of momentum and the loss of morale that we're feeling, especially in terms of the U.S. service production. But the upside to that number, the $2.16 billion, is that here in Toronto we're very unique because half of that is Canadian production. So when all of this clears and we get the go ahead that it's safe to go back to work. Yes. I have a lot of faith that people will be <clears> eager <throat> to work and everything is in place for us to get back to work right away. 
Hmm. Quinn, we know that there have been several businesses that really have not wanted to shut down despite being urged to do so. And I wonder yeah. whether any of the venues that you were scheduled to appear at or that you traditionally appear at, whether any of them uh, really didn't want to close the doors and wanted to keep going. Uh, no, for the most part, everyone did want to close the doors. Um, once the news started to show that it was spreading so easily and, uh, you know, unless you were social distancing, you were going to uh, increase the chance of, uh, of uh, contracting COVID-19. Uh, for the most part, everyone wanted to close down. Yeah, I think they were reluctant at first. They wanted to see sort of play by ear, see how it was happening. But the numbers started growing so fast that for the most part, people were just uh, jumping right in at closing down and postponing shows uh, as well as canceling some. Yeah. Torkel, I should ask you that as well, because, of course, when times are tough, we traditionally rely on, um, you know, we rely on artists. We rely on musicians and comedians and musicians to to kind of speak, uh, keep our spirits up at, at tough times. So was there a temptation to keep going? Um, well, no, I don't think there was a temptation to keep going, because I think um, it's become very clear very quickly that this is, uh, an equalizing event that every single person in society has a stake in dealing with this and every single person has a responsibility in doing what they can. And I think that artists tend to be very empathetic people and people with uh, great imaginations and a great sense of how their actions influence others. So I think <clears throat> artists were very easy to convince to get on board in this effort. But to, to what Samara said, I mean, I, I think it's incredibly encouraging that TV and film are in that position to resume as soon as this thing is over. I think that's to do with the fact that, you know, they are a for-profit aspect of our business, the, the real uh, decimation. And I think the potential for real long-term serious detrimental damage comes when you're talking about theater. Um, mm. Most theaters in the country uh, operate off box office. Um, those box office profits are now gone for this season, which means you can't plan for next season. Uh, the audience in theater skews much older than the mm -hmm. audience in, say, rock and roll or stand-up comedy. Uh, and that means that those people, those customers who are used to spending their money, say, at the Stratford Festival or at the Shaw Festival or at Soul Pepper, they're going to be hesitant to come back into spaces where they have to be among hundreds of other people. Um, and I, and most theaters operate <clears throat> with barely above water at the best of times. Um, and also to compound that, there is the fact that the Canadian Actors Equity Association is not actually a union <laughs> and there is no pension for theater actors. There is no EI for theater actors. There is no slush fund. There is no emergency fund. There's the Well, there will fund. be now. I should jump in there, because, of course, Prime yeah. Minister Trudeau made an announcement just the other day in which, and clearly, pe people who were actors and were getting paid and who are not now uh, yeah. would certainly be eligible uh, to replace some of that lost income with the the emergency response benefit program he announced the other day, right? And that's, that's tremendous news. Uh, it's definitely going to help people. Um, but if you look at, say, uh, at the average actor at, say, the Shaw or Stratford Festival, and those are the two biggest employers of theater actors in Canada. Uh, and if you look at, say, Mervish, take those three together. That's that's thousands of actors working for those companies. Those actors are used to making in the region of twelve hundred to two thousand dollars a week. It's a middle class job. So replacing that income with one quarter of it, while it's going to be appreciated and it's certainly a step in the right direction, it doesn't mitigate the enormous loss of income that theater actors are going to be experiencing, not just now and not just till the fall, but potentially for years and years to come. You know, when this all Understood. began, I had a few freelance jobs. Um, I was going to sing some music with Sarah Sleen. I was going to do some soundtrack work for uh, an independent film. I was There were three or four things, and all those things disappeared in 24 hours, and they disappeared because the cultural institutions that were trying to make them happen uh, at the slightest breath of disaster just disappear. Um, mm. So, so I, when I guess there what, are... the, re the reason I was, yeah. I, I wanted to be here today was to make a plea to people to, um, excuse me, sorry about that, was to make a plea to people to understand that um, this is a titanic disaster for performing artists. And while the rest of the economy might get back up fairly quickly, 
theaters are going to be suffering for years to come. Samora, it's it's one of the reasons why I want to ask you, what do you do when there is no acting to be done? Um, when there's no acting to be done, first of all, actors of all kinds are a part of a, the gig economy, right? Which I think is a larger conversation um, to have and part of my passion and work in my personal life and in my entire life, but certainly in my work with ACTRA as committee co-chair for diversity and inclusion is I do... Uh, really feel for our communities of traditionally marginalized folk, right? So performers of color, um, LGBTQ plus women who traditionally are thought of last and get the smallest budgets for whatever projects or who there are fewer roles for. So I think there's a larger conversation for us to have in terms of that. And it kind of folds into the theater um, conversation as well, because I started in theater. It was my first love. Um, and accessibility is going to be a huge conversation for that um, in terms of it's been a long-term conversation and getting a more accessibility in theater for all types of people. But when there's no acting to be had in terms of my movie is postponed and that's definitely a huge blow. I also run, um, similar to Quinn, I have my own business. It's the Actors Work Studio and we're hosting online script readings and free acting classes at the moment to keep the community engaged and sharp and focused. Specifically when you <clears> talk <throat> about, um, say, performers over 40 or performers of color, there's more time in between engagements. So there's already an additional pressure to be sharper, better. So I do encourage all artists to steep yourself in your art at this time, um, despite the economic hit that you've taken. We've been given this gift of time, so I've been focusing on that a lot. Um, and if anyone wants to join, on Monday we are having Jason Knight, casting director of American Gods, Titans, Snowpiercer. He'll be doing a live chat with the Actors Work Studio to give some tips to performers on how to uh, keep your spirits high and what you can do to keep your talent sharp in this time. I think artists have always had to bolster their communities in times of hardship. You think of during World War II in the ghettos, creating theater in the round to entertain and keep the stories alive for the next generation. So I think we're a resilient bunch artists, um, and I'm just trying to stay hopeful on how we can recover and stick together and not lose sight of our art in the fret and the worry. Hmm. If people did want to join in on that event that's taking place on Monday, how would they do that? We'll be going live through the Instagram page. So it's the Actors Work Studio. Anyone's free to join. And you could email us a question if you have. People have done that already. I'm just trying to think of ways to keep everybody engaged because as artists, the gigs sometimes are few and far between. Uh, so I know it's, it's a really hard time for all of us, but I don't think fear is the answer. And one upside is that ACTRA is lobbying with all levels of government to make sure that when these aid packages go out, independent contractors <clears throat> are not left out or forgotten, because I know that's a big concern for performers of all kinds. Traditionally, EI, how do you track the hours that you've worked and how do you make sure that you're not forgotten? So while it's not a lot of money, I think it'll be a survival money and we're really lucky to be Canadians. Hmm. Sure well, it are. is fair to say that there are some people who've gotten very creative during the course of all this. And I, I guess one of the questions that the Toronto Symphony Orchestra musicians asked themselves was, uh, how do you play concerts when you actually can't gather to play a concert? Uh, and they came up with a pretty clever solution. Uh, you three guests watch your screens. Everybody else, um, let me just ask our friend Chad Castle back in the control room at TVO to uh, roll the following video if he would. That is outstanding. Uh, Quinn, I don't know if that's an option for Camille. Yeah, I see applause, applause, indeed. Um, that's pretty creative and that's pretty fantastic. Quinn, I don't know if comedians can do that kind of thing, but obviously people are really pushing at the edges to try to figure out new and creative ways to keep going. Um, any thoughts in that regard? Um, you know, comedians make funny videos. So, uh, you know, anybody who was on uh, or is on TikTok um, and make short uh you know, funny videos that people can laugh at. It sort of keeps your name going, sort of uh, can hopefully be viral for you and uh, you can keep attention on yourself. 
Um, but the main concern is that there's no money to be made. You know, um, it's a good time to try to gain some followers and try to be funny and try to remind people and stay relevant. But uh, yeah, that's kind of the hard part. You can't do stand up. I mean, you could try, but I mean, you're not going to hear the laughs and that's the hardest part. Right. So I guess for a lot of comics, uh, it's a good time to also, you know, write, uh, sharpen your pencil and of course, keep it sharpened. But, you know, the more you write, I mean, I, sometimes you write something and you got some new heat and uh, the natural progression is wanting to get on stage and try it, you know. So uh, it's good to sort of, you know, gain that catalog and uh, write some new things, uh, stay sharp, but um, making new videos, trying to uh, appeal to your fan base. I mean, the fans are still probably looking at you to do something. Uh, in order to keep them uh, entertained, um, that that's the best you can do in this time. Mm. And do you have any sense about what's happened to all of the people that you used to work with? For example, I don't know, the, like the, the waiters or the bartenders or even the bouncers who who would have been a part of your previous life um, as you knew it. Um, for the most part, people in comedy have full time day jobs. Uh, so I think from there they'll probably be looking towards the eye if they're uh, you know working for. Uh, a non-essential uh, uh, the business or company. Um, but if they're doing full-time stand-up comedy, they're really struggling at this very moment. Um, mm -hmm. Much like what she said, it's it's kind of difficult. People were looking for some sort of payouts and, uh, you know, some EI and stuff like that. But, you know, comedians don't typically make, uh, you know, as independent content contractors, they don't typically make EI contributions when doing their taxes. Um, but we're hoping that something can sort of infuse the market and sort of keep people afloat. Now, there's only a handful of comedians in the country that are pretty much doing it full time. Uh, but for the rest of them who do have, you know, day, day jobs or uh, or what have you, they probably won't end up qualifying. But at least they can hopefully get, uh, you know, laid off from work, get a record of that uh, $2,000 a month that uh, Trudeau was talking about can uh, can help them. And of course, um, it would need to be uh, over time, in which case uh, people will slowly start filling venues back up. As the gentleman was saying earlier, um, you know, people are going to be uh, reluctant. Uh, it's not just going to be the snap of a finger and the next day everyone's just going to fill up the venues. I definitely think that is uh, people are going to be reluctant to begin with. Well, to be sure, you three would be eligible for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit that the Prime Minister announced the other day because your income basically uh, has been shut down as a result of this. Samora, I did want to follow mm -hmm. up with you, though. You, you represent uh, ACTRA. Uh, there's also the Actors Fund of Canada that's out there. Do you know whether any of these organizations whether they're able to provide any support to the artistic community uh, during the course of all this. I'm so glad that you brought that up. So yes, actors, I they're a long-standing support for performers in Canada. Check out their website. Actra has generously boosted our contribution to the Actors Fund of Canada in this time. Um, and there are some resources online that actors can find, script writing labs. The community has come together in that way of making sure you keep your tools sharp. Um, so that's something that we're, we're very proud to do and happy to do because it is really tough in the best of times to make a living as a performer in Canada um, and anywhere, but especially uh, in Canada. Um, our industry is growing, so there are more options. But now with this really hard break that we're taking, um, we have to look at the way we do things, in my, uh, in my opinion. Now, I, I love going to the movies. I'm a movie goer. The cinemas are not as full as they were unless it's a film with two cyborgs punching each other's lights out, right? Like that's, the industry has come to that place where the bar is set so high in terms of what commercial viability is that studios are less reluctant to make the types of movies that I grew up on and that I fell in love with cinema watching. Um, so that's something we need to look at, the way we consume our entertainment, the way we pay for it, the way we pay performers um, here. And yes, like me, I posted a bunch of comedy videos on my private Instagram just because I was here cooped up and I just wanted to let the characters out. But the question of getting paid for that is important, not just in, in this time of being cooped up, self-isolation, self-quarantine, whatever you want to call it due to COVID, but that question of what we expect performers to do for free has been a ghost in this industry um, yes. for so long. So I'm a little bit, not worried, worried's not the right word, but I am thinking of that because getting past the stage of your career where a performer, where you're expected to work for exposure is huge. And it feels really great to get to the part where someone is paying you to perform. So 
wetting your beak in this time and getting the audience appetite and the market trends are important. If you're pitching for, uh, to a network and you want to get a show off the ground or you're writing a grant for say, uh, Canada council for the arts grant, you have to know the market. So the market now already has an appetite for consuming and their entertainment online. So I am very interested in knowing how we can be a part of that, but also performers getting paid to do so. And not, I think that's, let me fall- that, that's let me really follow important up. Dork, what Dork, let saying. me jump in. Yeah. Hang on a sec, Dork, because because you wrote something in the Atlantic last week that I, that I yeah. want uh, I want to read the little excerpt of because it actually follows <clears> up <throat> on the point that Samora was just making. Here's the excerpt. For musicians, the arrival of COVID-19 came as a second cataclysm. The first being music streaming services' final triumph about five years ago over other ways of delivering music. Within a year or two, the 40% of our income that once came from radio royalties and music sales had vanished as sites such as Spotify exploded in popularity. These sites pay us an abysmally low royalty rate for our music. My band, Stars, had more than 9 million streams on Spotify last year. Our royalties from that service amounted to less than $35,000, and we split them six ways, minus management fees, minus taxes, for 9 million streams of our music. So we had grown accustomed to the sky falling. Uh, Okay, Tork, why don't you um, why don't you embellish on that a little bit here? Spotify, Apple, have they ever indicated to you that, uh, given the crisis we're in right now, they might be prepared to give you a greater royalty share? I tweeted Spotify about that the other day. Oddly enough, didn't receive any reply. I have heard that Spotify has started some kind of a fund for artists, but you know, uh, it's a little bit like. Um, going to therapy uh, to get over uh, getting beaten up and the, your therapist is the person who beat you up. Um, y- yeah, it, it is a disgraceful situation, particularly with Spotify. Spotify pays significantly worse than every other streaming service, uh, including Apple. Um, and it, it, I think what Samara was saying about the value of art, that this issue, this whole situation really brings home um, the fact that art has started to be thought about as uh, a luxury in our society, as a kind of um, trivial thing, a thing that you can turn the tap on, you can have some music playing in the background, or you can go on YouTube and watch a comedian do their set, or you can watch a show for free because you've ripped it off somewhere. Um, and and that, that the, the internet and that computers have contributed to this access to art without any real sense of who's making that art for you, the kind of money they might have spent or the amount of time they spent making it. Uh, And there's become a real disconnect, I think, for consumers between uh, consuming art and paying for it. Um, And it's pretty detrimental. And, And now we arrive at this place where people are trapped inside and where do they go? They go to art. They go to music. They go to they go to people reading. Uh, just saw Patrick Stewart was reading Shakespeare sonnets. They go and they look for art to get them through this. And while I appreciate all these celebrities from their various ten million dollar homes doing little skits for us and reading Shakespeare, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the vast, vast, vast majority of working artists who call this their profession are lower middle class people who pay the rent or mortgage just like anybody else and struggle month to month to make their bills. And they are working harder than ever, whether it's in music or in any other form, uh, to make less money. You know, I, I was an actor for 30 years. I come from a, a, an acting family. Um, and I know for a fact that the day rate, for example, on television shows is the same as it was in 1985. <laughs> for a <laughs> lot of people, it's less than it was in 1985. So um, well, let me jump in here and ask Quinn a question, because I think one of the great one of the great conundrums right now is that mm-hmm. when this COVID-19 finally does pass and we don't know if it's yeah. going to be weeks or months or what, do you think the the habits that we've established or most of us anyway, with physical distancing and so on, uh, yeah. will scare people from returning to the comedy clubs as quickly as you'd like them to. Yeah, I think it's going to scare people from returning anywhere. I think the malls are going to be empty. I think uh, people are going to start getting accustomed to shopping online and, and doing everything they can to, uh, to continue to social distance until it's fully clear that this thing is totally gone. Uh, obviously, we can all think back to when SARS uh, affected the city, and uh, they had to have a big, giant concert in order to start getting people back out again, right, to sort of infuse the city. And this idea of uh, of getting back out. What we can hope for 
is that with all the time that we've uh, had to be uh, spent uh, spend inside, um, isolated with our friends and family. Um, we can only hope that people will be sick of being indoors and will rush out again and want to fill up the clubs and fill up the bars and fill up wherever art is being uh, um, uh, presented. Um, but we can only hope for it. I, we can only hope for it. I think it'll only be a uh, it'll be a long time. I think it'll be a few months before people can get accustomed to going back out again. Well, Torkel, can you imagine what the, I mean, we, we, he's quite right. Quinn is quite right. 17 years ago, a bunch of people put together SARS Fest up at Downsview and a half a million people yep. showed up. Uh, and it was a, an, an important signal to send to the world that Toronto is back and you don't have to be afraid to come here anymore. Uh, I, I hope people are working on that right now. Maybe you got anything up your sleeve on that, Tork? <laughs> I, I, I certainly think that there are many smart people trying to make beautiful out of this. And I, I think that all of us would agree that over the past couple of weeks of this happening, while there's been moments of real stress and real sorrow and feeling the loss of work, the loss of opportunity to make something beautiful with your friends, <clears throat> there is also uh, incredible chances here to make things better. And I am 100% confident that people's impulse to be together and celebrate through song and dance and laughter and crying and telling the story of our lives together, telling each other the story of our lives, telling each other jokes about things we relate to. When this is over, um, I think people are going to come to us uh, as naturally as people go to the beach when it gets hot outside. And mm -hmm. I do think there will be a delay. I do think it will be tricky to get some people to go to the malls and I do think there'll be hesitancy. But in the end, the human impulse to, to experience beauty is incredibly strong and powerful. And the impulse to be beautiful is incredibly strong and powerful. And I believe in artists and I believe in our audience. And I think we'll find our way back to each other. And, and, and there's every chance that it could produce a whole bunch of amazing, vital, beautiful art from all kinds of different perspectives. And I think that there is hope. Always. That's a beautiful, beautiful way to put it. I want to save my last 20 seconds here if I can. Samora, I, I need to know this. As a as a big time Star Trek fan, you were in Star Trek Discovery and you piloted the star the Starship Discovery. And I need to know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> the Starship Enterprise. The Enterprise. Dis Disco was on a ship. We were in the Enterprise. We're doing our thing. Uh, it was amazing. I was just uh, talking to some of my friends from Star Trek, you know, keeping in touch with everybody. They've wrapped the new season of Disco, and it was a great experience. I mean, it's the most exciting. We shoot right here at Pinewood Studios down the street from my house here in Toronto. Uh, it's like making a little movie. Um, it was amazing. What can I say? It's wonderful. And there's so many people from crew to everyone uh, in Toronto who works on a set like that, when a, when a U.S. service production like Star Trek comes to town, a lot of people eat from that. So we're excited for that to keep going. CBS has just built a new studio here. Um, so the Toronto industry is ready to go as soon as everything kind of dies down. And as a Newfoundlander, I mean, storytelling is in my blood. All of my best memories from childhood are my pop telling stories and such a good storyteller about the history. So I agree. Artists um, and art and what we do and what we provide is totally invaluable to our culture. It's just up to everyone to remember that and not let fear take over. And we, the day rate for actors has gone up. Every time we negotiate, it goes up a little by little. <laughs> we make more money and um, it's only thriving. So I send so much love to every single person who's affected by this. Just hang tight, stay positive, um, and just try to find a silver lining. And I really hope we can all come together and do something like what Toronto did for SARS as an artist community. If anyone wants to reach out to me, both the gentlemen on the show, let's do it. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. I'm well, in. you are not just a Newfoundlander, you are Newfoundland royalty, because Samora Smallwood, your uncle, was Joey Smallwood, one of the last, well, the last father of Confederation. So we wanted to put that on the record before we signed off. Torco Campbell, so Quinn C. Martin, and Samora Smallwood, it's great having all of you on TVO tonight. Best of luck to all of you going forward. Stay well, everybody. We look everybody. forward to watching you all perform again. Sending love. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. Bye, Take Steve. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. 
CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.